Welcome to Wake Up with Ashland. It's good to be with you again. My name is Eric Brooks. I am the curator here at Ashland, the Henry Clay Estate. I'm always glad to have this opportunity to share some of our collection and tell some of the stories that we have here at Ashland. I appreciate the generosity of our sponsor for this and the great work of my cameraman slash editor Ken, who does amazing things to make this look good. So we're always grateful for that. Uh, today, I decided to do something a little bit eclectic um, we have in our collection about 4,000 items. Those items include objects, three-dimensional things, uh, manuscripts, papers, some published stuff, photographs, and books. So that's a pretty decent sized collection. It's not near as big as some. I mean, we don't have the 100 million items or whatever that the Smithsonian has, for sure. But it's not a bad collection for a historic house like ours. In the majority of that collection, I would guess probably 85% of our collection or something is out on exhibit at any one time, which is not typical. If you went to the Smithsonian, you would see at any given time between say one and 5% of their collection. Very little of it is actually out on display. And there are a variety of reasons for that, ranging from conservation to desire to keep things fresh and new, etc. But in a historic house setting, we interpret the rooms as period furnished rooms. And so that requires stuff. Furthermore, we don't have the storage space to put it away as would be the case at other institutions. Now, a lot of the items that you see in the house are interpreted on the tour, talked about regularly. They're very important. All of the items in the house are important, but there are some items that serve more as filler, as ways to make the room look interesting. Um, and that we don't talk about except for opportunities like this or perhaps an exhibit. So I call these hidden in plain sight. And there are some fantastic stories and really interesting items that we have like that. So everything you're going to see today is on exhibit somewhere out where people can see it. Um, I may do this again with storage because I've got a whole lot of stuff in storage that's really amazing as well. But today, everything you're seeing, you can see if you take a tour. So we're going to start here. This is a very small item It comes out of our permanent exhibit. This piece uh, is a piece that as far as we can tell belonged to Henry Clay. It's got his name on it right there. And on the top it has his initials engraved. Yeah, this is made of silver, probably coin silver. Uh, this is a mechanical pencil, also known as a propelling pencil, because when you turn the top, the lead is propelled out the end. Now, this would have been high-tech equipment in Henry Clay's time. This would have been a really cool gadget. All the IT guys who wanted to be really trendy had pen, uh, pencils like this. So Henry Clay would have been a real trendy person, a trendsetter, when he carried that in his pocket. Now, unfortunately, we don't know where or how this came to be Henry Clay's and what he did with it. We know that it was donated a lot of years ago by a couple who had apparently collected it. We don't know where they got it or how, what its story was up to that point. So that's unfortunate. Now, one thing we do know is that in the 1840s somewhere, Henry Clay was given a gift and he writes a thank you note about it of what he calls chirographic equipment. That means tools and equipment for writing documents. Remember that in Clay's time, there are no typewriters, there are no computers. Everything has to be handwritten. Handwriting was extremely important. It was something that uh, you had to do very well in order to communicate. Henry Clay did it very well. Uh, so he would have needed tools to do that. And this may have been part of that. Unfortunately, he never bothers to list those tools. So we don't know. So the next couple of pieces are out of the study, um, somewhat related to farming, and we actually have one that's related to writing as well. This piece is one of the few pieces, at this point I think the only piece we have, that is what you would call a natural specimen, i.e. an animal or part of an animal, something from the natural world. Um, we don't have much of this in our collection. This one we have for historical reasons rather than biological. This is the, cow, the horn of a shorthorn cow. And it is said to have been a horn from one of Henry Clay's cattle. Now, 
I don't know how the donor knew that. Unfortunately, here again, our records are scanned. Um, our record keeping for a long time was not as good as it is today, um, different standards and such, but this is said to have come from one of Henry Clay's cattle. Now we know Clay had a lot of cattle, um, was a well-known cattleman, and in fact is one of the people responsible for helping Kentucky to become the largest cattle market east of the Mississippi River. Now, he was best known for the Hereford. He introduced the Hereford to the United States in 1817, uh, a couple over from England with another gentleman here in the state. Uh, this is a shorthorn. He transitioned to shorthorns because the Herefords would eat anything. Any old weed, they ate it. Shorthorns were better adapted to the Kentucky bluegrass. They really liked the bluegrass and would only eat it. And he thought that was a better use of bluegrass than the Hereford. So that's what he ended up with. So this could very well be off of one of his cattle. Uh, it would be nice to know which one, uh, but unfortunately we don't have that information. Now these items uh, relate to horses. Of course, Henry Clay was a well-known horseman and a regular rider. These are stirrups. Um, they appear to be, perhaps be brass or at least have a brass finish. And you'll notice the foot plate has Henry Clay's signature sort of uh, cut into it, H. You know, Clay. He always signed documents for most of the years of his life, H. Clay. Now, here again, we don't have the full story. These have been at Ashland for many, many years and for a long time were on loan to us from the Department of Special Collections at the University of Kentucky Library. Well, these aren't exactly special collections items. They're not manuscripts or photographs, or those sorts of things that they would normally maintain. These are the kinds of things that belong in a museum collection where they can be interpreted. And they eventually transfer them to us, which is something we do regularly. We've done that a number of times in both directions. We've both given things to other museums and transferred things in. So it's a way museums go about making their collections better and more relevant, and we do it fairly often. Now, these were given to UK Special Collections uh, many, many years ago in the 50s or 60s by a gentleman who had bought these in the New York City area. I think it's just an antique store. And he thought they were Henry Clay's, so he sent them to UK. And for a long time, we thought that was a reasonable possibility because after all, it didn't seem likely that very many other people would have had stirrups with that in the foot plate. In recent years, however, two more sets of these have appeared. One in Louisiana and one in Virginia. The one in Virginia was found by a farmer who plowed them up in his field. This is in the western part of the state, the more mountainous part of the state, in the Shenandoah Mountains. Uh, I forget exactly where. Um, he contacted me. He had plowed these up. Uh, the other set in Louisiana, I was contacted by the owner as well. And while I don't think she had found them that way, they had an appearance that indicated perhaps they too had been excavated at some time. Well, this presents now three sets of stirrups in three very disparate locations that don't necessarily have any connection to one another. The gentleman who found them in Virginia had done enough research to think that perhaps Henry Clay's grandson, one of his grandsons, might have lost them while serving in the Civil War. And in fact, he did have at least one grandson who served in the war in the state of Virginia. So I guess theoretically that would be possible. Uh, given the presence of multiple sets, however, I think the conclusion must be reached that these were mass produced. And it may be that these are a campaign item. When Henry Clay ran for the presidency, particularly in 1844, a lot of things were produced that people could carry or wear or utilize to show their support. This would be the kind of thing that might get produced. Now, I've never seen any other set that is positively identified in that way where there is evidence to support it being a campaign item. So I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a, it's a reasonable hypothesis. Another hypothesis, frankly, is that this could have been made by Hubert Clay of, you know, wherever, as a seller of stirrups. And maybe he did this so that you know it's his stirrup. We just don't know. But they're interesting pieces and they remind us that Clay was a horseman and a regular rider of horses. So we have them in our study. This is another piece from the study. Now this piece was Henry Clay's, and we know that because it's engraved. 
uh, to our Senator Henry Clay from his friends, December of 1810. So 1810, Henry Clay is serving in the United States Senate. He's completing an unexpired term of a senator who had either retired or died, and by that time has been elected to the House. So he knows that in 1811, in November 1811, he's going to be seated in the House of Representatives. So he's finishing his time in the Senate, which will conclude the following March. So this is probably a thank you for your service. We appreciate it. We don't have documents that say exactly who the friends are, but we know that it is his because it's engraved this way. Now, if you open it, once again, this is writing equipment. This is an inkwell, and it's got several parts. These are to hold quills. The ink would go in this repository. This would be a reservoir for water, so you could clean your quill, or if necessary, thin the ink. And this little device comes out, and it's a shaker, what you would do is fill this with sand. And when you finish writing something, you would shake sand on it, shake it off, and that helped to dry the ink and solidify it on the paper. So that's the complete set of equipment that you need to write documents, which Clay would have done a lot. So this would have been important to him and something that he would have used frequently. Now, we obtained this from an estate, or from someone whose family obtained it from an estate, and the estate was of a cousin of a man named Shea Breckenridge. He married Henry Clay's great-granddaughter, Madeline McDowell. So we think that this item came through the McDowells to this individual, I believe in Maryland, and that it sold at his estate sale and eventually came to us. Now this is a box, you can see it's got a handle used for storage and, and uh, transport of material. It is tin, it's been painted decoratively. This is called tollware. You can see that it has the name Mrs. Susan M. Clay on it. Susan was Henry Clay's daughter-in-law. She married his son, James. This box, we think, contained writing equipment, something like that. She was a very intelligent woman known as a gifted writer. In fact, she served as a secretary for Henry Clay on some occasions and later in life wrote a lot of different things, correspondence. She wrote the only ghost story we have about Ashland, so uh, that's an interesting read. Uh, lots of other things. She and her daughter became family historians, and so maybe this was used for that sort of purpose. Um, so this is interesting evidence of one of the women in our story, and if you take the women's tour, we talk more about her. I also want to point out these two seals. These are wax, and I think at one time there was probably a piece of fabric or something between them, and that was designed to show that this box had been sealed so that the contents would not be removed. These seals are stamped Adams Express. Adams Express was the FedEx of the, from the mid-19th century all the way up into the early 20th century. It was how you shipped goods. It was one of the three main shippers of goods. Um, and the family used Adams regularly. Henry Clay used Adams at the end of his life. It was just getting going. Um, started in Boston and New York City. Um, the, the saying is, two men, a boy, and a wheelbarrow. It grew very quickly as to a national business. Um, so this had been shipped by Adams Express. Interestingly, this business still exists. It and its two competitors all exist. Adams Express, Wells Fargo, and American Express. All of those entities are now financial concerns, which happened as a result of the fact that in World War I, the government nationalized the railroads in the shipping business. So they gave money to all these concerns to make up for the business they lost, and they used that money and ended up becoming financial entities. So they do still exist. And I don't know where this was shipped or exactly what it contained when it was shipped, but it was shipped somewhere by Adams Express. This piece I included primarily because it's one of my very favorite pieces in the collection. It's not because it's terribly important historically, it's because, quite simply, it's a camel. And I like camels. I actually have my own camel collection at home. These are something you can get. I mean, more than one was made. It is metal. Um, it's been painted. This one actually has most of the original paint, as far as I can tell, and that's fairly uncommon. Oftentimes that paint wears away. It is gone. Sometimes it wears away and someone decides to repaint. So uh, this one still has, I think, the original paint. Uh, this particular camel 
you take this off, this is actually hinged and the hinge has become separated from its base, that should have a glass insert. So this is also an inkwell. Um, this one I think is a McDowell era inkwell. This dates to about uh, 18, or about 1900 and was made in England. Uh, so it's just a really neat, fun piece you put on your desk and uh, kind of hides the, the ink there for you. What you can see here is that we have a wide ranging collection that covers a lot of territory and includes some really remarkable pieces, some of which we know everything there is to know about, others we know very little about, but they're all remarkable. And it's really fortunate for us that we are able to have that collection and to preserve it and to show it to you and others. So we're very lucky to have the collection that we do. As always, if you'd like to know more, uh, if you go to our website, go to our catalog, there's a folder in there for Wake Up With Ash and all this stuff is in it. So take a look and you can read up on them. If you have any questions, obviously let me know. All right. So I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any questions this morning. Thanks for joining us. Brad, good to see you. Hope you're doing well. Uh, everybody is excited about March Madness. As the original home of University of Kentucky, we here at Ashland say, Go Cats. Woo, basketball time in the, in the big city here. So I'll be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. So I have a question, and that question was about the stirrups and perhaps in general about the artifacts that we're showing. Why are they located in the house where they are located? And that's an interesting question, and it's one for which the answer has evolved over the years. Uh, at one time, placement was sort of a function of aesthetics, appearance, or perhaps where the family had put something. So if there was knowledge that a piece was in a particular place when the family lived here, that's where it was put. And that, that makes some sense. I mean, there's some value in that. But over time, our interpretation has changed and evolved. And what we've done is put things in place in order to support the interpretation that we want to do. So basically, we've gone from stuff creating story to story creating stuff. So instead of having stuff and then making up a story to go with, or not making up, finding the story and putting the story with it, we said, this is the story we want to tell. So we're going to put the stuff in order in order to tell that story effectively and logically. So for example, the stirrups, are in Henry Clay's study because they relate to Henry Clay. We talk about Clay as the farmer of Ashland and have a picture of him in there riding a horse. So it seemed like the right place for the scrubs to be. Um, some of the other things are in other locations because uh, they support interpretation in some of those locations. The camel, for example, is in the nursery. It is a piece that seems like the kind of thing a child might have or enjoy, so we thought it would look good and work there. That's not a piece we particularly interpret or that has a tremendous interpretive value, but nonetheless, that's where it's located. So that's how we make those decisions now. It's a matter of what do we need to have in a particular place to tell the story we need to tell. So we'll talk more about that as we go forward. Good morning, Katrina. Is the camel related to? Uh, the camel is not. It, it probably has McDowell connections. I don't recall from the collection record on it that it was something donated. It typically, if it's not, that means it was here in 1950. Um, and when we opened, and that means it came, was here, left here when uh, Nanette McDowell Bullock died and left the contents to the foundation. So it could have McDowell connections. Uh, I don't really know. So I've been asked about the Ashland ghost story. And this is a story that we have from Susan, and it's the only ghost story we have about Ashland. So people ask all the time, is Ashland haunted? And I can tell you authoritatively, because I have been here at literally every hour of the day and night. I mean, I've been here all 24 hours. It has its creaks and groans. I mean, it's an old house. They do that. I have not experienced anything in this house that I would regard as 
supernatural or unusual or frightening or anything like that. Uh, that said, you know, it's an old house and, and people have died here, et cetera. Uh, so a war skirmish was fought outside, so it's reasonable that there would be a certain amount of energy associated with it. But we only have the one ghost story. Susan writes it first to a either a friend or a sister, I forget which. Um, and then later writes it, publishes it in the local paper in a, in a story writing contest and wins an honorable mention for it. And she says she's in the dining room. She leaves the dining room and goes to the other end of the house, to the uh, library. There, her husband is seated. And in the library, there's this gentleman in buckskins holding a musket, and he's dripping wet. And her husband says he just appeared there. Um, they sort of assert or sort of thought, you know, maybe they're referring to Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone never had any association with Ashland, never visited. So uh, it's hard to imagine why that would be. But he's there, uh, they look at him, he sort of salutes them, and then he disappears. And that's basically the story. So we don't know whether this is something that Susan actually believed happened or experienced, or if this is just something that she thought was an interesting idea and wrote up, we don't know. But that's our ghost story. Please feel free to share and like our story. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, tune in next Thursday because we have part two coming next Thursday in which we will finish downstairs and then head upstairs and do that. So got a lot more interesting stuff. Uh, so please tune in next week and check it out.